Welcome back to Reformed Millennials, the podcast where finances, economic trends, and sports intersect. Cam and Joel help listeners better invest their time and money. Also, it's important for listeners to understand that investing in equities, fixed income instruments, and or alternative asset classes involves substantial risk of loss. Any action you may take as a result of the information presented in this podcast is your own responsibility. The information in this podcast is presented as a general educational, informational, and entertainment resource only. While Joel is registered to provide investment advice, this podcast does not provide individualized investment, tax, or insurance advice, nor is it meant as a recommendation to any listener to buy or sell any specific securities or otherwise take any other form of investment action. This is an excerpt of the full legal disclaimer that's available on the landing page of this podcast, which includes whether Joel Shackleton, Cam Pitchers, or GIM have any ownership or interest in the specific securities discussed in this podcast. Hey man, day early, Tuesday, <laughs> not Wednesday. I am a terrible scheduler. We're just keeping everybody on their toes. Never know when a pod's going to release. Could be four weeks from now. Could be tomorrow. We could do the next week's. Who knows? Do you remember Bro Science? Uh, I do not know. Okay, so he would make these uh, YouTube videos where he would, at the end of each one, he would say that it's possibly, or it's possible that there might be one next week. <laughs> or Sometimes. this could be the last episode ever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And that is the case with this podcast too. I mean, we depend too much on advertisement. And at some point, we might have to find real jobs, you and I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really, I'm not sure what we would do without this podcast. Quite honestly, the bills. Um, Simon appreciates all of our lovely sponsorships. Um, <laughs> that's a joke, we don't have any. But... Uh, <laughs> Cam, welcome back. A day early, but quite frankly, um, I had an exciting weekend okay. of watching sports, mm-hmm. of, of spending time in Westlock, Alberta, which mm. is God's country if I've ever been to it. Um, stayed at a Ramada. Great views. Um, How was the hotel get, experience? Honestly, it had a slide. Simon was excited. And um, there was a place to get your oil changed in the parking lot, mm-hmm. which was a huge win for so us. So combining services. Yeah, it's yeah. good because my vehicle doesn't require oil. But nonetheless, it's nice to have the option. Tim Hortons, oil change location, mm-hmm. three-story slide. Didn't have to leave for the weekend if you didn't want to, realistically. No, never would. Why would you? Breakfast <laughs> provided. It was great. Um, but yeah, what was actually most interesting, at least in my opinion, mm-hmm. was the Canadian Open. Yeah, crazy. Yeah, we might as well kick off with sports chat again. But like we were talking about, well, we've been talking about the PGA story last week and how we we're talking Wednesday. I think the the, the live PGA uh, merger information had just dropped and we were kind of worried for our National Open that it was kind of going to be overshadowed mm-hmm. with all this news. And it definitely took up a lot of oxygen as we talked about last week that was not just sports news that was like across all news networks that was talking and that's more or less with the the saudi involvement and then everyone sharing their opinion on whether or not that should should or shouldn't be happening and i don't think we'll go into it today but obviously even the u.s some of the courts in the u.s are starting to take a look at things some of the senators down there and uh, certain states have requested information on the deal and what that's going to look like and the involvement of, I guess, having an investment from Saudi Arabia, which will be interesting to see how that all shakes out. But anyways, we had a national open. We have our, obviously, you and I, are most of our listeners here, we have, if you like golf, you kind of have some pride around the, the Canadian Open. And it's it's tough with its schedule because it's right before like the U.S. opens. Another major is coming up this week. So it's kind of one of those ones where you don't have the best field because some guys are taking the week off for prep, but others actually want to get that tournament in right before. So pretty good field. And for those who, I guess, don't follow, we had a Canadian, Nick Taylor. So shout out to Nick Taylor. Um, he's won a couple times already on tour, but he just broke a, I think it was 59-year drought Maybe even, no, maybe it was 69. Yeah, 69 year drought for a Canadian winning its own national open. So congrats to him. It was great theater on Sunday. So (laughs) like, I mean, again, for those that might not 
I understand her fall golf that much. Like he shot three over in the first round and then shot 20 under in the next three in, that in aggregate. Was tough. Well, in comparison to most, because usually you see really super low scores that tournament ended up being 17 under one, which is, I mean, still high in comparison to, you know, major championships or whatever, but still it was dramatic on the Sunday, went to four playoffs holes or five playoff holes and the TV numbers backed that up. So I was reading a few things today. So CBS drew over 3.3 million viewers for that, I guess the final round. And that's the best number they've had at that tournament in the last 23 years, which was, you know, peak tiger time. So to have that kind of number is, is pretty amazing up 19% from the prior year where Rory won. So, and even last year's was pretty dramatic. If you remember too, like it was, I think between two or three of the biggest hitters kind of coming down the last four or five holes. So, um, you know, PGA really, are they in the news for the right reasons all the time? It's kind of dramatic, et cetera. As we've sat, talked about before, the old adage that, um, you know, bad publicity is still publicity. And they've been on kind of a rocket ship these last, like, 12 months, especially just with the... I'm not sure how successful the Netflix thing was. I think there was a little bit of bump there, but um, just more media attention in general. And I think the drama has added to that, um, the interest and the intrigue around things. And then not to mention the fact that they just had a bunch of awesome tournaments this year so far like their schedule this year has just been i think increasing the you know we, we said we found found money in the in the couch cushions for all these guys to start earning but it's funny how that obviously is a motivator to get better fields better action you've got the the live drama and the guys come brooks kepka and phil mickelson competing at the two major tournaments the first these first two of the year so you just had all of this intrigue and interest around the game. And even in an event like the Canadian Open that may or may not be seen as a marquee event for American fans, CBS drew, you know, a 3.3 million, 3.3 million viewer number, which is kind of rivals some of the NBA finals numbers that we've seen. So we just had that close off in the la- or last night. So Denver Nuggets won their first championship. I think for 46 years they've been a franchise and that's their first championship. So pretty crazy. I was the one of the principal owners, I think it's Stan Kroenke of uh, the Nuggets. He's now won. He's owner of the Colorado Avalanche. So Stanley Cup winner last year, Denver Nuggets this year. Also principal owner of the LA Rams. So won the Super Bowl no more than 18 months ago. And then I think he's also, I think the Colorado Mammoth, which is the lacrosse team in Colorado has also won. So, I mean, like obviously not a yeah. major four, but so four championships in 18 months, I think I read for how'd, this guy. How'd, how'd that guy make his money? No idea. Hmm. We could probably look that up as we're talking, yeah. but the, he's, he was, he moved the Rams from St. Louis. I think he's also part owner in Arsenal, if I'm pretty sure. So <laughs> had a pretty good year um in general with his uh, investments in various sports franchises so um we don't really i know we've we've chatted a, a bunch about both the nhl and the nba and and the i guess our interest and intrigue around what the final numbers are going to be from a broadcast standpoint we've talked a bunch about obviously the fracturing of of our attention and whatnot and how that's gonna i guess play out in in some of these major sports that have seen such increase in tv deals but now with this kind of shift away from i guess traditional cable and and whatnot it's going to be interesting to see how how they stack up in terms of past years and not to mention the fact that both in both leagues sorry excuse me this year that we have kind of non-marquee teams in the finals so i think nuggets heat for the most part the early returns on that is that it's more or less even with past years uh, the NHL, however, is sharply declining. Uh, I saw, again, it's it's tough to comment with only, like, part numbers. I think, like, sometimes, like, some of the streaming numbers and whatnot and eyeballs from that will probably add to this. But in terms of, like, the tr- traditional route of just watching, like, TNT, TBS, who have the broadcast rights for the finals this year in the States, they're down 37% comparably to last year, which would have had... I mean, last year you had the Avalanche and the Lightning in the finals, so... I mean, not necessarily marquee cities, but marquee franchises in the league for sure. And, big name players. And big name players. And like the intrigue of like, that was the Lightning's third consecutive final. So they're going for a three-peat. Colorado, best team in the league, et cetera. You kind of have these two 
you know, Vegas and there's good stories. There's always good stories within every team's run sure. to the playoffs. But in, in terms of intrigue around the final, I mean, there's so many things like nobody I mean, cares. Nobody. It, it's so out of, I, I was talking about this with my father-in-law and I said, you know, for the, like he, he would be the perfect example of someone who is like a, he likes hockey, but he's other than outside of the Oilers, he wouldn't follow it unless there was intrigue around it. So like very fair weather, but so he was asking me like, Oh, how the final is going. I'm like, I can't even comment on it just cause I've lost interest. And usually I'd be someone who would at least be, I would watch probably like 60% of the games, probably in full in most mm-hmm. years. And I haven't really watched more than a period or two. And I think the, and the NBA actually, I think they had comments on this as well. You get into June, you're starting to, people are just starting to, uh, lots of people in the States are probably shifting focus to the NFL. It's more interest around the draft and, and then OTAs and the, and the free agent signings, et cetera. So in, plus you're just going into summer where people are just shifting their, their focus. And th- the fact that they take like two to three days off in between games, sometimes it just my, it's so mind boggling. Like I understand like bigger travel lots of the times cause you're usually dealing with an East and West, but when you have momentum, especially coming off potentially like really good, I mean, I'm not sure if this year was a great example of having really good semifinal or conference finals, but you have this momentum where it's it's on every other night. It's something to do. Like the you know round one of the NHL playoffs is the best time because you just have four games a night going, going, going. So like once we're down to two teams, like why don't you want to keep that momentum going by having game, build up, game, game, build up, game. And you have this this delay in between for travel time, et cetera. And everyone just loses interest. So I think they need to rethink that for sure. I think there's obviously a lot of things we've talked about in other podcasts about changes that we would make and, and, and things we want to see. But in general, um, I mean, I think, you know, the NBA can kind of rest a little bit on its laurels with, with how much it's built up. Um, and it's just, it's, it's general, um, the excitement around the NBA, et cetera, is just, it's just higher. But I think both have, there's been examples of both this year where it's like, I'm not sure if I like the approach that they've been taking yeah. in terms of putting out their content. No Connor McDavid, nobody cares. So I, let me get back to something <laughs> that um, I care more about. Mr. Kroenke. Mm-hmm. So okay, yeah. while you were talking about the NHL and everybody tuned out of the podcast, I was looking into Mr. Kroenke and um, interesting, humble beginnings his father owned more lumber company and his first job was sweeping floors there. He was doing the books by 10 and Mm -hmm. was an avid athlete. But what is most interesting, and this is something that I find is probably the best financial advice, Mm -hmm. not financial advice, but financial advice. He married well, good man. And his strategy after getting married was brilliant. And so Kroenke married Anne Walton who just so happens to be the heiress of the Walmart fortune. Okay, so then, but he's not directly in with the Broncos. No, so what's okay. most interesting is that he actually did make his money on his own, sorta. So he founded the Kroenke Group in 1983, a real estate development firm that built shopping centers mm. and apartment buildings and developed many plazas near Walmart, mm. which is, Kind of a good idea. <laughs> now, it's interesting that I didn't put the two names together. Yeah. Because I'm a big fan of a company that does this in, the, in Canada. Um, but also, I read a long thread on businesses that, and founders of those businesses that became billionaires just by building around Walmart. Yeah, having good anchors like that, right? Yeah, which yeah. I actually think is one of the, or arguably one of the most important um, business strategies for people to to kind of model Mm. it's a great copycat method Mm -hmm. and if you can find those those instances whether it be digitally or um on the real estate end i think it's just a it's a really yeah i know from i know from talking to you know clients in the in the commercial real estate space like i mean that that's kind of the the goal right is like when you're when you're developing out is if you can get a marquee anchor in there like a I mean, in Canada, like a Canadian Tire, Home Depot, Walmart, like these types of things, just they attract the foot traffic, which then brings in the other um, leasing opportunities, et cetera, for a lot of these complexes. So I can't imagine that. Uh, well, obviously, 
uh, Mr. Kroenke's uh, approach to that was very successful. So I just know of him from, like, I mean, so he moved the St. Louis Rams to L.A., so he was in the news for a long time about basically being hated <laughs> as an owner. But, um, yeah, I mean, he's got his he's got his fingers in a lot of things. So, uh, yeah, congrats to the Nuggets. I mean, that was, again, not necessarily the most uh, intriguing NBA Finals, but... I, and again, not necessarily any, I mean, Jimmy Butler, I guess, might be viewed as kind of a top 10 player ish from like a excitement standpoint and or, or storyline this year. But in general, like, you know, you don't have, I would say you, you did not have um, the top 10 like movers and shakers in terms of like newsworthiness um, in the finals. But you did arguably have the best player on the planet playing that no one necessarily knows anything about in Nikola Jokic. Did you so, see his picture from when he was like 10 years old? Yeah. I think that was me. I think I think it was you actually. It looked it just you guys went in two different directions. You just yeah. you kept having the baked goods and he <laughs> decided <laughs> just he he is such an interesting player to fo- like so I one stat. So Jokic played 20 games in the postseason this year. 600 points, 269 rebounds, 190 assists. Never before in NBA history has a player reached all those numbers over any 20 game span, regular season or postseason. So this guy just puts up like he's a, he's the ultimate all around player. I mean, he's a seven footer with hands and vision. It's there hasn't really been anyone like him. He's a unicorn. He probably should have won MVP again this year, which would have been three in a row. There's, I mean, there's a lot of good players to pick from, and everyone gets voter fatigue with those kind of things. But yeah. I think it's a very interesting case study in, like we talk about how the NBA markets their stars. Like this guy, he doesn't, ha- he has a, he's actually pretty funny if you listen to him in his interviews and stuff like that, like really dry and obviously kind of a different background being from Serbia and getting to the NBA. But he was basically like, I need to get home. Like I want to go home and hang out with my family. I want to go home and he's a huge horse racing guy. He wants to go home oh, and see really? his horses and stuff like that. Like he does not have that, I guess with most other stars, they have this, this swag about them almost, I would say like informally. And he does not care about that. It just could be the furthest thing from it. So he, um, it'd be interesting to see because like, again, he's, you know, again, marquee player, multiple MVP finals, MVP now, Denver not necessarily or had not been on the map in terms of interest and intrigue historically, but are now kind of set up. They've been there before. Now could be a multiple winner potentially with what they have there. If they're, you know, another Canadian shout out, Jamal Murray won last night. Congrats to him. That's pretty cool seeing Canadian on that big stage in the NBA. But anyways, very good for them, but it's, it's just one of those things where there wasn't a lot of oomph behind the NBA finals this year. And you realize that all those years we were quote unquote spoiled with the Warriors Cavs matchups and everyone's like, Oh, this is bad for the game. It's like, no, that was unreal for the game. Even though you knew who who was going to be in the finals before the season even started the, the storyline and drama to get to there and seeing the best on the best, at least in your um, like for the, for the general NBA fan or general sports fan, it was amazing. So it's, I'm sure they're, we talked about before, they got a lot coming up for, for the NBA in terms of, you know, new negotiating deal in the next, I think, I think they want to get going on that in the next 12 months or so. So it'd be very interesting to see because they're not necessarily, um, these last couple years, they've seen some stagnation, um, both either created themselves or, you know, via the, the bubble, COVID years, et cetera. So I feel like maybe we should talk about this now before, but mm-hmm. the Ottawa centers sold. Yeah. Last little sports note. Yeah. So this morning it got announced, uh, I might butcher the pronunciation, but Michael Andler group. So you might want to check out, you can quickly comment on his, I think he's a, uh, I think he's in the pharmaceutical side of things, but out of Toronto, um, it's got a conglomerate of owners. I think he's obviously the principal. I think, um, so Eugene Melnick's daughters, who are the ones who, you know, own the team after the estate, uh, after Eugene passed away and went into the estate, they were the one controlling. I think they've actually retained 10% ownership as well. So that's actually kind of interesting. That's um, good. Yeah, that might have been a piece that was obviously like, there was basically uh, over the last, you know, couple months, there's been, you know, upwards of 10 different groups talked about, but it was re- realistically four serious bids. And 
I think it, they didn't necessarily go with the highest bid. They went with the one that fit, obviously, what the NHL was looking for and maybe what the wants and needs of the of the Melnick family was as well. So, I mean, obviously, retaining some kind of local ownership, I think, was important for them. I think, obviously, him making a commitment to the city of Ottawa is important. And it sounds like, obviously, these guys checked all the boxes. So that final price was reported right now at $950 million. So just a shade under that billion-dollar number. But I think when you consider the fact that the Melnicks are retaining 10%, then I guess the valuation technically would have been over a billion if I think that's how it should work out, if 10% was retained by the Melnicks. So big number for the NHL, you know, market setter for sure. We talked about the Forbes list that we would have reviewed maybe a, a year ago saying – the Senators were valued, I think, on the lower end of the league at like 600, 550 million or so. So definitely uh, a number that a lot of the owners in big cities are probably very interested on and probably might want to pull the trigger. Like we might, I would think that there might be some more interest in uh, selling teams in the next little bit here, considering yeah. this, uh, this new benchmark. But so yeah, that, that, uh, saga is over. Um, the only thing I will say is that it's interesting. I, I, I think this group, this Michael Andler group, etc had a pre-existing relationship in the hockey world uh so that there's probably some comfort there um but we, we've talked about all these marquee names that were attached to other bids the ryan reynolds snoop dogg the weekend none of them ended up being part of the group that that won the bid so very nhl to stay status quo and not have you know one of these i guess more pop culture-y type uh ownership groups or at least uh facets of the ownership group but at the end of the day, it sounds like a good deal for Ottawa. It sounds like a good deal for, you know, the exi- other owners of the NHL to use this as a benchmark on a go forward basis. So I'm sure they're seeing it as a win. I'm sure they don't love the fact that it was announced on the same day that the Stanley Cup could be handed out later today. I'm not sure if that's a, you know, great news story or, or maybe they want that buzz since there hasn't been much around the finals to begin with. So maybe these people will be like, oh yeah, news story. Where's the Stanley Cup finals at? Maybe they'll tune in for the game tonight. But um, in general, it's uh, you know a interesting news story to, to have followed because I think if you were to have asked me 12 months ago what I thought the Senators were going to sell for, I don't think I would have chose that number. Yeah, um, I I was wrong. I'm pretty sure I said it was going to go for a billion dollars. You said a billion, so you were yeah you were incorrect. <laughs> yeah, I mean in in the Actually, price is I, right but, terms, wrong. However, yeah, very close. Very close. Yeah. Uh, good for them. Good for the family. I, I, I'm a little bit disappointed that they didn't get the, the lead investor, or I shouldn't say, like you mentioned principal. I feel like having that brand ambassador yeah. ownership would be a good strategy in this case, and they clearly didn't prioritize that. And maybe that was the decision of the Melnick daughters. Potentially, and yeah. Hard to say at this point, but um, Michael Andalore, He's a healthcare guy. Yeah, okay. Um, I think it's ATS Health or something like that is the business that he is the CEO of. It sounds like he's he's committed to Ottawa. All the good things are... Yeah, are, that's always a really important piece, right? Like, I mean, I, I think there's there's always been... Yeah, Snoop Dogg wasn't going to live in Ottawa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think... And there's always, there's always a chance, obviously, that, you know, they can bring someone else on in that kind of role after the fact. Like, that doesn't need to be part of the original ownership group. Maybe you can get someone to... Uh, or you can maybe seek out your own rather than kind of being forced into one person um, based off of a bid. So it'll be interesting to see where that goes. So let's move on to markets here um, without talking about individual stocks, which I'm going to avoid for a while here. I think that today's most recent release was um, inflation data. And it came out that the rolling three-month average for non-core, so when you, when you uh, pull out um, energy and you pull out uh, food mm-hmm. out of United States inflation, it's now rolling at an annualized 3%. Now that mm-hmm. isn't actually what the year over year number is, but that is a three month annualized of 3%. And that's getting darn near close to their target of two. Now, while that is currently what Chair Powell is focusing on, I need to draw people's attention to what is likely going to be their next topic in order mm-hmm. to argue for continued yes. tightening and or a sustained high rate. Yep. And the last time that we had core inflation at 5% annualized, that would suggest that I think back in the 80s, it was um, the actual interest rate was 10. So 
while a lot of investors, um, Stan Drunkenmiller being one specific, that had mentioned that in order to break the back of inflation, actual interest rates have to be below, or sorry, rather higher than going core inflation, we are there, mm -hmm. which is now what I deem to be kind of that tipping point. And it's going to be very interesting meeting over meeting to see the commentary changes, how they change their, their wording, um, and whether or not we get rate hikes. Uh, the United States is tighter than Canada. Uh, the last, last month we had a, I wouldn't call it a surprise raise. I do think it was um, unexpected, mm -hmm. but it does speak to a Canadian environment where we are still very concerned about the going interest or the going um, Canadian dollar to US dollar rate. And uh, we're sitting at 134 roughly right now. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the sweet spot for a commodity exporter. And that's just going back over the last 30 years where we want it to be. It's not great for us to be to have a weaker dollar um, for all of our other industries. It, it's, it supports the exports, but it also hurts services and it hurts the, the value of, of our assets in general. And also, we don't like to have it too strong either, right? There mm -hmm. is that, that happy medium for our economy, the way that it's constructed. And right now, our, our Bank of Canada has to juggle a few things. Well, their mandate, again, is always tight employment or, and, and uh, stable prices yeah. or interest rates around 2 to 3%. They definitely are considering multiple other things. And, and keep that in mind. We are... They are battling a very difficult housing market. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I kind of wanted to talk about with you. The stock market is the stock market. It has, it has now been 52 weeks since we saw a reversal in the S&P 500 new lows list. It finally stopped making new lows, literally 52 weeks to this week. And since then, we've seen a rally in tech stocks of 30%, 20% in the index, 20.1 or something, roughly. And... Um, Banks have lagged, obviously, in that 10% mm -hmm. range. We've seen some problems there. And that largely has to do with the yield curve, interest rates, et cetera. So now we have found what seems to be an agreed upon multiple at 5% interest rates. Where do we go from here? Do we go tighter? Are we going to see a, a uh, Federal Reserve or a Bank of Canada that um, cuts rates at the end of this year. Currently, markets are pricing that as a no. Yeah. That was changed two months ago. We talked about that on this podcast. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't look like where employment is and where current rolling inflation is, that they have the willingness to signal that there could be rate cuts this year. So if you are somebody who is trying to make a call on your variable interest rate or your fixed in interest rate. This is a challenging p time. You are in that, um, that position where it's very difficult to determine whether or not the, the upside is worth it. Yeah. And I think one thing I, maybe I want to talk to you about, and this is something that I did a really poor job, probably 100 episodes explaining. <laughs> I still to this day wake up sometimes thinking, Joel, you did such a bad job describing marginal demand. And I, I want to just kind of have a back and forth with you on this. And it's around real estate. So it's no secret that I've been looking for houses for, I don't know, 40 years. And um, <laughs> right now we've gone and we've looked at plenty. And we've seen, and if you talk to any real estate um, or agent, agent yeah. they are talking about how there's still lots of demand for houses. Mm -hmm. But that is, but that's got to be put into context. There's no supply. And there's only a, there are a lot of people looking mm -hmm. for homes relative to that supply, mm -hmm. but not relative to averages. Yes. There aren't a lot of people shopping for houses. There's a lot of houses or people shopping for houses relative to how many are available. And what that means is, is that you can have a, a market that has, let's, let's use Apple shares for, as an example, let's say they have a billion shares. There's only like 25 for sale. And that sets the price for all billion of those shares. Mm -hmm. And that is an illiquid, very tight market. Mm -hmm. And it, is, it does a poor job accurately pricing homes. So now we're seeing this, this reality where a, a very desirable high-end homes 
sure, there's going to be the rich guy that doesn't care about the 6% rate. They probably can go to their bank and get a 3.7 rate because they have business interests there. They have yeah. over a million dollars in their wealth management account. They have all of these things that they can flex to get that preferable rate. Yeah. And then there's the regular family, perhaps, that doesn't have those things. That is, on an upward trajectory, they have high income and they can barely qualify. Mm -hmm. And then there's everybody else who's just fallen out of qualification right, yeah. uh, realm. And those homes that aren't quite in that upper echelon or desirable, you're seeing there be a big price gap where they're dropping prices. Yeah, and then sure. there's those that are incredibly desirable that are still maintaining those 2021 prices. And at the end of this long monologue here, what I'm trying to express is that we this is what a ugly, illiquid market looks like. And if you are an advisor or a um, real estate agent who is telling people that it's a good time to sell or a good time to buy, you're not giving everyone the right or the, mm -hmm. the, the, full, the full picture. Mm -hmm. You're not painting the picture as it actually is yeah. because that's not accurate. Now, if you're selling a house in a very desirable area, that would yeah, oftentimes just, be bought by wealthy people. Yeah. Probably you'll sell it. Yeah, I, I mean, there, there is like, as you, did you say marginal demand, is that what you say? Yeah, use the term? Yeah, like, I mean, it's just very, it's, it's less so a guarantee <laughs> as compared to, you know, two years ago when we saw the, the height of, of home exchanges um, in our market and across the country, U.S. too. I mean, that, that was a, um, an event that spurred out of, out of COVID, essentially. And there is still, I mean, you, know, we, you and I both, I think, review market data on, on houses quite often. Like, I mean, I'm either from a personal interest or from a professional interest standpoint. And I think it is really easy to see that the anchoring to prices still exists, but like, I would be interested to run some, some data and I'm sure it's out there in terms of like homes in areas that like average days on the market and, you know, average price drops and, and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Because I, I would be, I, that was not happening <laughs> two years ago. No. Whereas, so like, like you said, I think homes are still selling and, and potentially selling higher than we would have expected them to, but it, there's less of those happening and it, it is very much more regionalized specific to your, you need to have the right buyer, the right group of buyers for your home to sell and to make that decision. So I think it's like, I, I, I know you, you talked about like Canada specifically and, and where we could see rates going. I think CIBC came out early this week saying that they actually don't project a rate cut potentially until kind of spring, summer of 24. So that, that's definitely a change in rhetoric. And I, I know, you know, we had commented on that previously. So I think there's going to be a lag between anything that's potentially coming down the pike with, with the U S rate cuts. And I think we're probably in it for the long haul. I, I think they're probably still waiting to see, you know, more consistent data. We've, we've talked about this before, how you know, we had all of these rate hikes in such a short time frame. There's a lot of things happening very fast over a short period of time. And the fact that we are now seeing maybe some data that would suggest that we would be in a position to potentially cut rates, halt rate, cut or halt rate increases, et cetera. There's still not a huge sample size of that. And we're coming off this, like we've talked about this before, coming off this crazy, volatile, uncertain time in a lot of facets of our economy. And to now make, they're essentially making reactionary calls along the way. And now we don't, I think, taking the, taking the approach to be non-reactionary and actually take in more data to make a more informed decision mm -hmm. is probably a good thing. I think one thing you wanted to touch on this week, and I mean, it's, it's definitely led a lot of, news outlets, especially in the financial world, talking about the impending commercial real estate, commercial debt issues that are probably on the horizon with apparently a lot of data pointing towards lots of mortgages and, and debt coming up for renewal in the next 18 months or so. Yeah. So those, there's, there's obviously a lease problem. There's a, it's, it's almost like this slow motion crash. That's yeah. Occurring. Yeah. And and that's got to have an effect on the on the whole. Thing. I mean, I know we're talking about residential specifically, but I mean, our our I, commercial real estate market uh, in both. You know, how, how much is is on the bank's balance sheets? Especially, I mean, obviously, there's typically some more strength or um, 
Think uh, about pensions, certainty. actually. Well, that too. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're the largest owners of and um, sovereign wealth funds, yeah. um, pensions, as I'd mentioned. Think uh, teachers' pension. Think Aimco. Think all of these incredibly large pools of capital. Where Aimco is in the two hundred plus billion dollar range. They are your owners of your commercial mm-hmm. real estate that you're looking at when you look downtown. Sure, yeah. there's wealthy families that own individual buildings. Mm-hmm. However, when you look at these these locations largely, especially you go to Toronto, Calgary, Vancouver, New York City, San Francisco, even the, the small office towers that are housing four or 5,000 people, those are owned by institutions generally. Mm-hmm. Maybe, it's, uh, maybe it's Harvard, maybe it's a certain fund, BlackRock, Blackwater, whatever. Those are who are the owners of these things, and they do have a significant capital base, but they're also willing and able to take write downs for tax reasons, as you would know. They are willing to do these sorts of things in order to reorganize, redeploy, cut risk, take advantage of certain situations, and it is a slow moving car crash. Now, with all that said, I do think I've officially seen a, a change in sentiment for the first time in two and a half years, three years, with regards to office specifically. Mm. Now, is this because there are enough people in the older generation that are asking for this, or is this truly a change in work productivity? Is this a realization that we are no longer able to manage large organizations um, digitally? Is this a realization that there needs to be more hybrid? Am I just talking and spitting into the wind here or peeing into the wind here and saying what everyone has already been thinking? Have I gone back and forth, back and forth, back and forth on this? Yes, mm-hmm. probably. However, Paul Graham tweeted this, and I and um, Sam Altman actually um, reiterated this. Now, these are both guys that ran YC Combinator, very, very, very influential people in the Valley, and um, are arguably two of the most important people in startups specifically. Mm-hmm. but. Paul Graham says, I've talked to multiple founders recently who have changed their minds about remote work and are trying to get people back into the office. I doubt things will go back to the way that they were before COVID, but it looks like they may go all, may go, or they most, sorry, (laughs) but it looks like they will go most of the way back. Why were all these smart people fooled? Partly, I think it was because remote work does work initially. If you start with a system already healthy from in-person work and partly because it seemed to evolve recruiting, which is always the bottleneck, there will definitely continue to be remote first work companies in his opinion. Mm -hmm. They were before COVID and it works for some businesses and there will be types of jobs like customer service that will commonly be done remotely, Mm -hmm. but remote work first won't be the default in his opinion. So now I tend to agree with this in a lot of ways. And Mm -hmm. Paul Graham, Sam Altman are on the leading edge of this work from home change. Those businesses were the most a bit most capable. They were the most technologically savvy. They were the ones most incentivized to do this. They wanted to get the cheap labor outside of the United States. They had all the incentives for this to happen for them. And they're now backpedaling to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. We can come back to your and my professions Mm -hmm. and recognize that this is already the case. However, that doesn't change the reality that there's 30 to 40% vacancy in San Francisco. There's 20 to 30% vacancy in New York City. When you look at Calgary, it's in that, the high teens, low 20s as well. Is it possible that we've seen a bottom in office commercial real estate? I think, this is me not making a call on anything. I do believe for the first time in two and a half years, and on this podcast, we've talked about work from home at nauseum. I do think for the first time, there's a sentiment change. And I think that my millennial generation and above are in agreement here that professional development, um, even just business development, but then even our ability to perform at a high, uh, a high level, is hindered by work from home. Mm -hmm. And I myself personally can speak to this in our business. It was a struggle for me the last 18 months with regaining traction within the firm and the people. Um, It was a loss of communication, Mm -hmm. just just relationship wise. Yeah, trust building, et cetera. All of those things, um, even training, I can see that 
just being even worse in large organizations where you can't just go and have coffee with six people mm -hmm. and have a get together and your firm's back together again. Yeah. It's not that easy for 4,000, 5,000, 10,000 person organizations. Exactly. And it's of my opinion that while this may mean nothing for the price of commercial real estate, because I do think that that is irreparably um, changed, mm -hmm. it's irreparable at this point. Mm -hmm. I do think on a go forward, there is going to be businesses looking for tenancy. There's going to be a, a change. Certainly, they'll be asking for new things. They are in the position of power here. But we've, I think, the, yeah, the, the winds have, have shifted. I think, yeah, the, the way that it's going to be different. It's not going to be a return back to what it was five years ago. I, I'm totally in agreement with that. I think there has been this massive shift in expectation of employers, especially of employers of, of decent size to offer these hybrid models, work from home, et cetera. I think that that's number one, there's going to have to be a shift back in that because I think the the job market, especially when it was super hot, um, there was like I, I can speak to this. I mean, if you if you go through resumes and uh, interviews, like that was a hot hot topic that brought up. What is your position on this? What can you offer me in terms of the ability to work from home, etc.? So I think employers in general are going to have to have a a strong stand on that to say, hey, like we understand we want to work with you with this stuff, but at the same time, you know, our stance is that you need to be in the office X times per week, X times per month, or these months of the year, it's non-negotiable. You are in the office specifically for, you know, these tasks and these reasons. And I think before it was just so willy nilly that in the first, when we were forced to work from home, we developed all these policies and procedures and workflow tactics to get things done and keep things moving. And people fell into that fell into that and have not necessarily come back to address the fact that although we I would say a lot of companies were very successful in being able to transition that was great that they did not realize the things that would be hindered by that hierarchy or that organization of of work and so we've we've talked about this you just mentioned the the, the training side of things the the, the, the professional development, I think that the trust and relationship building that is sometimes not talked about as much, but if you, you know, if you read about anyone who's been successful in business, they talk about relationships and trust and, and the, the general pulling. Mentorship. Yeah. Well, and, and just like everybody pulling in the same direction. Right. So I think you are, I've seen a market, a marked change. And even just within my own firm, with the staff that have committed to being in the office more. And I think it's just, uh, I mean, this is a, it's on a very small sample size, uh, just with just my firm, but obviously the, the rhetoric and the, the general comment commentary on this has, has spread to some of the biggest business centers in the world. It's like a lot of the same comments that these, the Sam Altman's are making or, or, or at least uh, observing um, are, are the same as the things that, you know, you and I are talking about week to week here or behind closed doors, et cetera. So I think it's going to be a very interesting time in the next 10 years of our lives as professional millennials, Gen X's, that whatever it might be, the, the, the younger folks as well. You know, we have this kind of a, not attack, but this, this, this change with, with AI, this opportunity, this speed bump that's going to come up. We're all going to have to learn how that's going to interact with our daily lives as professionals and as business owners, et cetera. And then we also need to kind of reshape what is it, what does a organization look like? And, you know, what's your office space look like? What's your, what's your position on, on remote work? Where, where can you use remote work to best elevate your company and where do you need to have the the interpersonal side of things as well so i i know for myself this i kind of see myself as being on the uh just going into the prime of my career and i i kind of think about these things all the time as being very like think existential things that i need to step back and think about but we all get bogged into the the details and the the weeds of the day to day and it's like we everyone needs to think about these more macro level items that we need to consider with our our growth and our our change into the future so let's talk about industrial revolutions this is super fun 
Mm. I remember paying attention to this when I was younger. So this is probably one of my most, <laughs> the actual, like the original, like the steam based industrial revolution, like I, like going through history and like class of that, I actually really enjoyed it. You know, it's really, the reason why I brought this up today is not mm-hmm. because I wanted to do it like a history lesson for <laughs> everybody, because mm-hmm. that's not the intention, but the largest amounts of wealth are built in these, um, around these revolutions historically. Now I'm going to go through it and I'm effectively identifying what is being called the fourth industrial Re- revolution. So the first one being steam based machines. Um, each one of these revolutions is effectively an improvement in human efficiency and mm-hmm. our ability to compound work and produce goods and improve the standard of living of humans. That's it. Simple. Mm-hmm. Now, the second one was the electrical energy based mass production. Everyone understands that. So steam, electricity, now the computer and an internet based knowledge. So the first one was the 18th century. The second one is 19th to 20th century. And now this third one is the late 20th century. Mm-hmm. Um, just the think automation about, of things well, and manufacturing no. plants. So this is, I mean, I, I encourage everyone to read the, the knowledge machine, which is the, the founding or the beginning of the internet and the computer mm-hmm. and how they went about building it. Um, the, 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 the government programs in which pushed it, a lot of it was based around the, the Second World War and then um, is now evolved to what it is today. But the fourth industrial revolution is this, the idea of artificial intelligence and information technology. And this is, <clears throat> I think, something that has really picked up steam 2010 to today. And we're really starting to see these, <clears throat> the, I, we're imagining this. And you can see it within the way in which certain sectors are trading right now from a multiples perspective. NVIDIA trading at 30 times 20, 30, 30 expected revenues. Like, it's just insane, right? Um, the people are recognizing that this is a marketable shift mm-hmm. in our ability to produce and um, find efficiencies. There's a lot of people talking about how this solves the demographic problem. And talk, there's all of these ideas. <clears throat> and I tend to sympathize with a lot of them. But for those that are, are always looking for the next opportunity, I mean, this is that situation for us. Mm-hmm. This is, we're getting our industrial revolution. For, for those that are, are stuck in this idea that it's never been a worse time or it's never been less affordable to buy a home, also look at the, the reality that is, it's also never been better to leverage technology to accomplish more for a cheaper price. Mm-hmm. You can chat GPT and GPT-4 is accessible for $20 a month. I think that we, there's a million places to look and see um, headwinds for millennials and for, for, the, for the younger generation. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I sympathize for that, I, I truly do. But go find yourself an organization that is going to allow you to take advantage of these things. I'm doing it myself. Go and find that place that is going to empower you and you will not be worried about the affordability of a home. Just focus on the, the good. Mm-hmm. Stop um, dwelling in, in the negative. And I think that that would be a, uh, a positive change in, in, your, in your, your personal sentiment and your, not only that, the luck that you end up having. But I am excited. It is a little bit crazy. Well, I think the, the thing around, I, I started thinking about the saying, like, you never know that you're in the good old times when you're in them kind of thing. Yeah. I think similarly speaking with like from like an industrial revolution standpoint or what, whatever this might be, you don't know that you're in it until it's over and oh. we're in it. So I like, this guarantee is to you, Simon is going to turn 18 and be like, John, you were so lucky, dad. <laughs> exactly. Dad, you're so lucky. You don't realize how hard it is for me. Yeah. And, well, and that, that's probably. It, yeah. Every single generation is the same with that, right? You always look at the pr- prior one and say, well, we don't get these things, but then you don't think about the things that you do have in comparison. So I think one thing I'm, I'm trying to employ and obviously want to put out, put out there is that you, well, we've talked about it before, I guess, and just embracing this change and, and find new ways. I think a lot of what the commentary is on how hard, how millennials are the first generation to essentially be in a worse off position than their parents at their same age kind of thing. I think that's, that's been talked about 
ad nauseum and and how this is going to be a big or a big issue in the future i think it's also like we are a part of a generation where and and the ones behind, coming behind us we're going to be finding a new way to create what the baby boomers had and we're going through this we've gone i mean the, the computer and internet based knowledge revolution actually wasn't that long ago realistically so you're thinking about maybe having two pretty big revolutions or big changes in how we either get work done or make money, socially interact, et cetera, et cetera. There's probably going to be even more of this within our lifetime just because of the computing power and, and how fast things develop and change. I'm sure we're, we're going to go through even more of this before uh, we kick the bucket. But at the end of the day, it just boils down to embracing these things and finding ways to not ignore them and bring in little bits and pieces into your day to day as you move forward. So, um, and, and to your point, finding, finding the right employer or finding the right support staff to get into a position where you guys can all be pulling in the same direction on those kind of things is, is like ultra important. Cause if you, uh, if you're part of something that is like, we're not accepting this or we're not adopting this or we're not even considering this, then you're kind of you're compounding the issue if, if you yourself are not investing in it as well. And this um, transitions to my recommendations for the week. Mm-hmm. Um, Charlie Munger, in his most recent interview with uh, the Founders Podcast, he went he had a dinner with the, the guy who does that pod. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Listen, I can't recommend it enough. But the one thing that stuck with me was his his advice for those like career advice effectively. Mm -hmm. And it was to find yourself a great organization, put yourself inside of it and never leave. Let that compound. And I think that that actually um, coincides really well with Morgan Housel just put out a podcast recently. And I just learned this, but his book, the the psychology of money is the third most read financial book in history. Wow. I think the only one above it is, um, the intelligent investor and Graham and I'm forgetting the other one, but rich dad, poor dad. <laughs> actually that's what it was, which is so sad. The Velcro wallet. Um, but that is incredible. I've been saying for five years that he's the best financial writer of our time. Last year he puts out his first book. He has another book coming out, um, in November, I believe. Mm-hmm. And he has a podcast out that just, I think it's like 15 minutes and it's the power of staying put. Mm-hmm. And, um, I listened to it to myself and I found it to be, it just hits home. Some things just hit home at the right time in a lot of cases. And mm-hmm. I really respect him as a person. He doesn't know me from a hole in a wall, but uh, he's been really helpful for me. Mm-hmm. And I recommend everybody take a peek at that. Easy listen. He's got a great voice. And um, that's my recommendation for the week. Mm-hmm. Uh, check those two podcasts out. They will be in the newsletter. Yeah, what I'll have to, have to make sure I pick up on that Morgan Housel piece I saw that you recommended earlier this week and he's always got great stuff and I mean that's I'm not a huge reader um, but that book is I think currently sitting on my my uh, nightstand so I will I've passed it, it around time. to a lot of people you so. have yeah no you, you've definitely been a good advocate advocate of uh, of Morgan's um, messaging so I read a lot I'm just a bad reader slow yeah. <laughs> um, recommendations this week I haven't honestly been I didn't consume as much this week as I normally do. I, I don't love to give comedy recommendations just because it's so subjective <laughs> and I don't want people getting the wrong idea about who I am as a person necessarily. But I did, uh, we've talked about Tim Dillon before. So, I mean, again, comedy is subjective. I think he's such an interesting, he's a very interesting interview. He's also a very, he, he's created his own little, media mogul himself um and so outside of the comedy so he was on with tom segura this week another uh pretty prolific comedian who's out of the last call it five years kind of built his own little media empire uh with, with his own podcasts etc it, it was very interesting to, for there he was asking tim about like actually a serious topic for about three seconds of the podcast and he was talking about <laughs> how he basically uses his podcast to fine tune his comedy routine and essentially talking about how this podcast medium allows him to riff and get feedback on just general takes that he would have or situational things that he's talking about that could lead to comedy bits. And then that 
basically fine tunes his his hour stand up or his 90 minute uh, routine or whatever it might be for like a special or for, or for whatever it might be. And so it was just interesting to hear from, you know, someone who's in the kind of in the arts and in, in performing arts, et cetera, talk about how they've been able to like kind of feeding on that, um, comment you made earlier about how you're going to use, you know, technology and new mediums to, to leverage and, and, and get better. And that's what he does. Like he does this. I'm not sure how, how often he puts podcasts. I think you listen to him more often than I do, but you know, whatever it is, weekly podcast, a couple times a week podcast that he might do and how he uses that, that day to day thing to then assist him in his, like, you know, the other moneymaker or where he wants to perform at his best is on stage when he's doing his, his routines. Mm -hmm. And so I thought it was kind of interesting, especially coming from someone who's like, you know, obviously not serious at all ever. Everything is satirical. Everything is tug in cheek with him. And he obviously just says things because he thinks that they're funny. He's not because he actually believes them. Um, that's which is, really important. Well, I mean, that's the thing with say. comedy in general. I think some people who have a problem with, with, with comedy and, you know, the best of all time, we're all controversial. Yeah. You go through the list, you know, the Chris Rocks, the um, uh, George Carlin, you know, take your pick on, on, on the, the greatest of all time uh, in, in relation to comedy. And there was always issue with what they were saying because it was controversial and you have to wade through that. And at the end of the day, comedy is supposed to be, it's an art and it's also, it's also subjective. So you have to obviously take all that with a grain of salt. But anyways, he's, it was very good inter- about an hour and a bit long podcast uh, interview. And I was laughing for about 55 minutes of it. And he is, uh, like I said, he's a very interesting, very interesting guy in terms of his approach to, I think a, a lot of comedians and, and whatnot have had gone through a, a pretty big transformation in those COVID years. And you can see the ones that have been most successful on it have been able to find ways to, to fine tune their craft and, and not necessarily be so reliant on the gigs and, and now have this, this podcast tool or other media tool to become popular and have a following. And then that just increases their ability to elevate their, you know, stand up routines, etc. So anyways, I was kind of taking, it was obviously you listen to those things most of the time just for the entertainment of laughing, but I was also pretty intrigued with his take on, on how he's used the last call it five years of transforming himself to, to be more successful. Yeah. I, I'm a huge fan, but I'm going to leave it at that. And um, we'll talk to you sometime next week. Who knows what day it'll be. New episode every week, probably, maybe. (laughs) Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday, Friday, Thursday. Depends on Joel's schedule. (laughs) As long as you download and subscribe. Thank you.